So we are going to see identity and access management, one of the security measures provided by Amazon. It's quite familiar to quite a lot of people, but let us see how we can get it implemented in AWS. So that is me, let us skip that part. So the agenda is we are going to see what is IAM, <clears throat> what is the core concepts that make up IAM, and we will see some use cases of how we can configure it and use it in our real world. And finally, we'll put that configuration use cases as a demo and let us see we can set it up on the AWS console as well. So when you're talking about administration and security, there are a lot of services offered by Amazon and our focus area is going to be on IAM only right now. So when you're talking about IAM, think of it as your front door to the cloud. You have your cloud and then if you want to access anything, any resources or any services in AWS, IAM will provide you the access keys for that. And then using those access keys, it's quite powerful. You can configure admin level access or you can configure user level access or you can configure admin level for a particular service alone. So there are multiple ways you can configure IAM. So what IAM allows you to do is it enables you as a user or a consumer to control who can do what in your account uh, to put break it down. Let us say you are an admin for AWS. You can decide whether your database administrator, that is the who part, can access your application servers or not. So that is what the who can do what in your account. And you can go have very, very centralized control or very fine grained controls. You can do it either way. You can broadly say all people have access to all resources. Very centralized, very simple policy. But you can go ahead and also do something like a person A from India cannot access my production machine, which is sitting in US Virginia region. So that kind of a fine grained control is also possible. Another interesting thing about IAM is it is uh, secured by default. Almost all the configurations are denied. That is nothing is provided. If you remember in few uh, videos, I was shown you where security group will not allow all the ports that we might not need. For example, port 22 will not be open by default. Port 80 for configuring a server will not be open by default. If you are doing EFS, uh, port 2049 will not be open. You have to go ahead and open each and every one of those ports uh, so that you can access them or uh, make sure that somebody access is denied also. So you can have allow access as well as deny access. In short, IAM also follows the same principle. Everything is denied by default, whether it is for individual users, uh, groups, and you can configure either for allow or deny access. So IAM broadly uses uh, very familiar concepts, especially people from uh, who's already doing IT might be familiar with users, groups, and also permissions. So it takes those three core concepts and combines it in a different ways to provide access to resources. So when you are talking about users, uh, it is nothing but the individual people who might be needing access to the machine and how they are going to access the machine. You have two mechanisms of accessing your servers here. In this case, Amazon resources can be accessed using your AWS management console. That is the GUI that we are all familiar with. That is one way of accessing your resources. The next way is using your CLI, that is command line interface. Uh, so people who are familiar or who are comfortable going ahead and executing commands on the terminal can go ahead and start using your CLI. All the flexibility that or all the functionality that you can do in your console can be done on your CLA also. Then there is a third kind of access that you can provide to your users that is SDKs or APIs. Say you are a developer, you are very good with Python or let us say .NET or Java, then you can interact with your Amazon resources using those programming languages also. Amazon has written fantastic APIs for all the services and everything that you can imagine or almost everything that you can imagine with the management console and CLA can be done with your APIs also. So when you're using a management console to access it, you will be using your username and password. Whereas when you're using your CLI or SDKs, you will be using your access key and secret key to log in to your servers. So later we will see how to generate this access key and secure key uh, to connect your resources. So that is on the access part or authentication part. When you're talking about authorization, what I can do after I logged in, what permissions do I have? These permissions are configured as policies 
and the policies are nothing but a JSON document, just like a notepad file. It's the format is something like a JSON, JavaScript object notation. And this policy document will decide whether a permission is denied to a an user or a group or a role, or you can decide whether a user, or in other words, you can allow as well as deny. Both those permissions can be written in those policies, and those policies can be individually assigned to users, groups, and roles also. When you are talking about roles, it is nothing but think of a group of people who are assuming a role as a database admin or a web sphere admin or a middleware admin or monitoring team. So those roles, every human can assume certain rules, roles and then they can move on from one role to another role also. So each of those roles will come with certain policies. So let us look at what the users itself provide. It is an entity. Uh, it can be a human or it can be a service also in AWS. That is also possible. So you can configure an user ID for a server, say EC2 server, and it will assume the user ID password and it will connect to S3. So that is also possible to do it. And we, as we saw, you can use your user controller password or access key or your multi-factor authentication. It can have a combination of uh, all these three things to access your servers or just one of them to access your servers or resources. And this is what the what part of an user. So when you can do it, whenever a human needs an access or whenever a programmatic access has to be provided to an AWS service, then you will configure it. A nice use case on example is listed down there. Say Rob requires access to an EC2 instance and some S3 service, then I will go ahead and create an user ID for him. And let us say Rob has created an application and that application needs to store data in Amazon DB then I will create an uh, access key and secure key or a role for that application itself. So these are the different ways uh, when you can use IAM users. So that is on the user part of things. When you're talking about uh, groups, let us see how a logical, uh, how logically a group is built. This is one example. This is not necessarily you have to build it this way, but you might find this useful to have a hierarchy set up. So under an AWS account, you can create a group called as DevOps group and then another group called as uh, test and dev group. And then you can have some users here and then have some users here. So the same hierarchy might not follow in your organization. You might have different hierarchy, but this is how the logical arrangement of your groups looks like. The another arrangement is something like I have administrators and then I have applications which will be having their own roles and responsibilities. And then I also have developers. So I will have groups based on this category also. So you can go ahead and do it that way. So now we have created users or we saw what is users. We saw what how to create groups. We are going to see now policies. What are these policies? How I can really write them? So we will come to the right part later. Let us see what are them. Uh, as I said earlier, they are JSON formatted documents to describe your permissions and there are no permissions by default. When you create an user, absolutely that user cannot do anything. They might be able to log in, but they, if they click on every other link or service, it will say permission denied. Uh, even for reading the access, they will not be able to see what resources are configured also. So no permissions are given by default and you can define what permissions to give an individual user and what actions they can perform on that resource. So that is the power IAM policies gives to you and you can individually assign these policies. Let us say you have written a policy, a very detailed policy for service level and EC2 so and so people can do so and so things, so and so group can do so and so things. And you can assign them individually to individual user also, group also, because the policy is a programmatic document, so it will execute it in a nice sequential way and see if this rule is matching to this user or not, whether this rule is matching to this group or not, and apply it appropriately. So an example is given here, say Chitra is an UX designer, and you can provide Chitra access to S3 resources, whereas Prasad is a database administrator, and you can provide access to him through EC2 and RDS, and you will not give him access to any other resource at all. So these are just a simple example of a, a need for a policy definition document. So what exactly you will combine in a policy document? These are the uh, six elements that will combine to give an access and all six of them is not necessary and all six of them are not mandatory also, but you will always define the who part of it. 
that is uh, who is the user who is going to be impacted or who is the principal whether user or group and next is what actions they can take whether they can access in this case we are configuring chitra s3 access if you remember from the previous example so we are configuring the username here and saying chitra can get that is a read and then put that is the write operations so chitra can make more both read and write in my s3 bucket and which bucket i want a chitra to get access i have put a star here so that uh, that means that all the buckets are accessible to chitra here and then finally how long do i want this access uh, this is expired but let us say that you can configure it up to 31st of december 2018 also that is also possible and i'm also ensuring that chitra can do it only from my corporate ip address uh, you can go ahead and say my corporate ip address range is this much and only from this ip address i should be able to access my s3 bucket so i'll go ahead and say where part and finally if i want to have it more secure and I will say Chitra has to access using a multi-factor authentication, say an OTP code or an RSA token has to be entered each time there is a request that is made. So that fine-grained control is given to you through your policies. So here is an example of a policy which provides a read-only access to an S3 bucket. Here you can see here I have created a test demo bucket and then everything under the demo bucket is being given and get object permission. So actions and the resource and principle is what the who part of it so this is the syntax of an json document so you don't have to worry about you need to memorize these things you need to write these things amazon has fantastic policies pre-written for most of the use cases you can go ahead and consume them of your own so we'll see that in a short while there are two types of policies one is you write them another one is amazon managed so for 90 percentage of the use cases the default policies will be enough and if you want you can take the default customize it and start using them as your own so this is what i'm talking about so when you say inline policies you are going to write them on your own hand coded there are some policy generation simulations are possible uh, but sometimes if you want to really secure them you will have to go ahead and some do some configurations and management and understand how it works but if you don't want to do that, you want to do a hands-off approach, you can of course go ahead and use any of the managed policies that are provided by Amazon itself. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the use cases have predefined the policies and you just go ahead and search for them and click on them and use them. Mm -hmm. So that is how uh, two policies are uh, provided to you and there are a couple of other differences between them. Uh, one is when you're using inline policies, it is strictly mapped to one a relationship that is uh, the resource to the who is providing permissions that is nobody else can use that uh, there's a, you have to have a strict one-to-one -one relationship between the policy and who can use that and in case there is uh, a mistake or somebody has wrongly attached a policy to a wrong principle you are fully responsible for that uh, but when you are talking about managed policies that is almost impossible because the policy is written in a very generic way and it will have a lot of conditions and a lot of statements to validate it is not being misused in any way and whenever you go ahead and uh, delete the principle that is who is using it you also have the responsibility of going ahead and deleting your inline policy in short the management of your inline policies that whatever policies you write whether it is written properly assigned properly uh, deleted properly all of them is on your responsibility and this amount of code that you can write in an inline policy is also restricted but when it comes to managed policies which is managed by amazon you have uh, the power and control of amazon aiding you in providing your very secure policies because they have tested it and a lot of other customers are using it so you can rely back on them and if there is a version change say for example amazon has changed an api and they have made some changes on the way that uh, in so principle they have started calling it as a principle one and you will have to go ahead and change your inline policies so that your policies are still compliant but in managed policies versioning rollback changes all of things are managed by amazon itself you don't have to worry or make any changes on your side and the policy sizes are also really big and because it is done by amazon there is no limitation on the policy and you can go ahead and start using them so my recommendation is if you are in need of a policy go ahead and check managed policies if it is not there then go ahead and start doing inline policies so roles 
the best way to look at roles is think of a team of uh, six to eight people so a couple of guys might be uh, developers hardcore python java .NET developers but they might also be part of a devops team who might do also monitoring activities so the same person who was a developer now is also doing some monitoring activities so in those cases i don't want to create an individual role saying person a is doing both the roles let me write configurations for uh, all of them in one policy then my policy becomes really really difficult to manage because i cannot customize it uh, for each and every individual who is coming to the team because the next person who comes to my team might not have devops skills he might have only a database admin skills so in those cases what i will create is roles so a role is nothing but a set of permissions which can be associated with a certain user or a group or a service also so this way those permissions can be transferable or they can be assumed by anybody who comes and takes up that role uh, so a team lead can be one role uh, sme can be a role uh, db can be a, a db role or db admin role or web sphere admin role all those multiple roles are possible and you can go ahead and create them and in today's demo i'll show you how to create an ec2 server role which will access your s3 accounts without any user id and policy and i mean user id and password management so let us say a policy you have written very flexible very very uh, customized for your account so this policy can be assigned to an individual user so this user will get all the permissions from this policy so that is one use case the next use case is you can assign it to a group of people also say you create a uh, say a database administrators or a monitoring team l1 support team so you can have some policies assigned to the group also and likewise if you write another policy you can get that policy assigned to your roles also so the now roles has certain policies who can assume the roles i have an iam user who can assume that role or i can have aws resources who can also assume that role so this way it is quite flexible in my opinion you have policies which are assigned to individual users groups and also roles and roles also can be assigned by my individual users so they can have more permissions which is not given to them when they are just logged in as an 